28, June 26, 2017. And seeing as though nobody has signed up, I think we should close the public hearing and go ahead on with the <laughs> regular meeting. So, uh, regular <coughs> meeting of the Ordinance Committee, June 26, 2017. Uh, can I get an approval of the minutes, please? A motion. A motion to approve the minutes, Mr. Chairman. Second. Second by Ms. Manis. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Uh, unfinished business or tabled by items? Do you have anything you want to take off? Point of clarification, has there been any um, information given regarding these items that you were looking into with the town attorneys? Okay, thank you. If not, then let's move on to new business. Uh, the Groundwater and Vapor Intrusion Zone Ordinance, 17-09. Uh, first, I would suggest, Andrea, that you come up and give us a little overview on this, and please, and tell okay. us where we're at with this. Um, Andrea Boyswain, Director of Health for the Town of Stratford. Um, I have passed out um, what I uh, crafted, which was a sort of a technical brief. Is Just your mic on? I think so. Oh, okay. I will, I will speak closer to the mic. Um, I issued a, a technical brief on the proposed groundwater and vapor intrusion zone ordinance. Um, where I summarized uh, the purpose of this ordinance. And it's really, um, it's, its uh, motivation is coming from the Environmental Protection Agency, um, but we are supportive of having um, a method to institutionalize information about the contaminated groundwater from the Raymark site. Um, its intent is really to protect health, safety, and the general welfare of um, residents living in that area, which is largely Ferry Boulevard, Housatonic, Homestead, Willow, Minor, Riverside. Yeah, so it's that um, general general area. Um, and it's, as I said, it's really to institutionalize the information so that we make sure that it uh, um, is in perpetuity kept so that when people moving, you know, the young couple that moves here from Akron, Ohio is going to know, you know, go in with eyes wide open. Um, it's going to restrict the use of contaminated groundwater. That area specifically does not access it for drinking water. They get drinking water from the Trap Falls Reservoir. The wells, the private wells are up more towards the north end. <coughs> It will document uh, which buildings currently have soil vapor mitigation systems, which, by the way, are just really, you know, highly engineered radon systems. Um, and it will also uh, document which ones do not have um, the systems in place. Um, it will ensure that systems remain in place and are monitored with enforcement authority, which is, per this ordinance, invested in both actually in the health department as well as the DEEP and the EPA. So we have a contact at the DEEP, Ron Curran, who is the project lead who comes to town at least probably once a week and looks at other kinds of aspects of the project, including looking at how the um, cover is, or the, uh, the cap is at the what's Stratford Crossings but he will also go around and sort of look to see, you know, if anything has been disturbed. Um, and uh, if this will allow us to, uh, the ordinance will also allow us to monitor um, future projects so that if a parcel is, say, subdivided, that second parcel development, that home will also need a subslab ventilation system. We had one that was in place in a home that then was demolished and then it was turned into a huge home on Housatonic Avenue, and they did not have a system, even though the conservation group, as well as my office, you know, encouraged them to put it, and they had to finally, they finally did put, uh, put one in. And we'll play a role. This ordinance allows us to play a role in maintaining that list, and we will do it in conjunction with the Office of the Town Clerk and the Tax Assessor's <coughs> Office, and property-specific documents are kept um, for those because there are already 110 homes that have 
um, I'm sorry, 104 homes that have them. And so, so people can come to the health department and look at those reports where it shows we came, we sampled, we put in a system, this is what it looks like, um, and this is the, the forever maintenance contract, which the DEEP is, um, or in their contractor for right now, it's AECOM. They will be monitoring, um, and so if the alarm goes off or the system is, is broken or, you know, they call the contractor um, and they come and they fix it. Um, Oh, I'm sorry. Thank you. you. Um, I have a question for you. Um, I, I'm more concerned about the vapor intrusion because I, I think people don't have wells and that type of thing. Um, my understanding is that you have a list of all the uh, gr uh, houses or businesses that are supposed to have vapor intrusion. Uh, uh, the, the, whatever they call that venting system. The, right, yes. the vapor intrusion. I was told, and I don't know how true it is, that several people on Hunting, on um, Housatonic Avenue either don't have it or uh, removed it. So it, when the uh, federal and state environmental protection agencies came in in the 2003 to put those, to do the sampling and then decide to put them in, um, there were 117 homes, um, I'm sorry, 121 homes where the systems were offered. 104 people took them up on it, 15 declined, they refused, and DEP had to send out, you know, official formal letter saying, yes, you declined, knowing that there are potential risks. Um, 17, so 17, 15 refused and two needed to be built after the fact, so there was that large home on Pusatonic Avenue that had to have a system put in. There are still several places that do not have systems. EPA and the DEEP have gone to them and have offered. And Olivia, how many are there? They're in the process of actually installing several right now. So as part of the next phase of the EPA project, they, you know, one of the things that was left over was that they didn't, some residents were like, hey, I bought this house and I didn't know it didn't have a system. So EPA, um, at our urging, offered those people a system to, be, to put, put in. So yeah, of those 15, and we have 17. Olivia works, this is Olivia Coleman. She's a health program associate in our office and works. Mr. Chase first, then Ms. Knapp. Yes. <laughs> Currently, um, we don't identify these areas as zones. Is this your committee? That is what this ordinance will do. So the groundwater zone is just. I understand. The, okay. But this sets up zones that yes. we never had before. That's correct. Why are we doing that? Why are we setting up specific zones? Because they are on top of the contaminated groundwater area. So it's an area that's impacted by contaminated groundwater. The larger groundwater zone is the study zone. So EPA has monitoring wells at the perimeters of that zone to continue to monitor and we'll be sampling to make sure that the contamination doesn't migrate even further. And the vapor intrusion zone identifies those homes that have or should have a, a fancy radon or radon system in. Do we do zones um, expand the area? In other words, are you capturing within this zone more businesses than houses? No, there are more houses than businesses. That's not what I asked. So the, we're setting up the zone. Yes. Are these, uh, and you've got a border here, are there any additional businesses or houses that weren't in the original uh, what is it called, unit two. And that's why EPA will continue to monitor to maintain, or excuse me, to, to monitor whether or not that zone will be expanded. It hasn't expanded beyond 
what was originally identified in 1998 or, or 2000, excuse me, 2000. So Is that you're saying that, now you're saying that these zones could expand beyond oper uh, operable unit two. Well, they won't expand beyond operable unit two, but they might expand beyond, say, well, I guess that's Riverview. Riverview is the far west. Yeah. Could you identify yourself and connect I, to the mic? I did. Okay. <laughs> I'm Olivia Coleman. I'm with the health department and the health program associate. Um, and I was just going to say that there's, there's already OU2, which is operable, operable unit two, which is the groundwater study area, and that's been in place since they originally identified all the operable units in town. So that's not really something that's new. Um, the, the groundwater zone is basically OU2, um, and that's not really expected to grow. That's, that's just the study area, and not all those homes in there require a mitigation system. So the vapor intrusion zone is a smaller zone within <coughs> the groundwater zone. So the groundwater zone is really just saying you can't dig a well or you can't access the groundwater. Um, but the VI zone, the vapor intrusion zone, is a smaller zone within that zone where you need to have a, a mitigation system in place. And that could expand depending on continuing test, the, the testing that they continue to do. Um, but I mean, right now they're not expecting it to expand. So what we have here isn't anything bigger than what we've already identified. Thanks. Now, what are the bases that will contain this? Thank you. There are posts that are on the ground. <coughs> the, the, they're called volatile, orga or volatile organic compounds. So those are, you know, like if you, know, you were to, if you were to open a bottle of nail polish, in a few seconds I would be able to smell that. That means that's the, the vapor that I'm, that I'm smelling. And so the products that were in the groundwater um, that we're concerned about are the one. Right yes, okay. yes. One one dichloroethene, uh, vinyl, vinyl chloride, trichloroethene, um, benzene, which was they're not sure that the benzene is actually from the Raymark. Um, one 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 trichloroethane, chlorobenzene, and um, toluene. Those were the the compounds that they uh, they studied. Mm -hmm. I had some more questions, but I'll get some out soon. Yes, ma'am. Um, <clears throat> of the 17 people that have that declined back in the 2000s, mm -hmm. um, how many of those 17 are now in the process to get new, new so how many people are going to be still without? Sure. So um, DEEP, through the EPA's new record of decision, DEEP is able to install with their contractor mitigation systems and everyone that accepts it. So right now, I believe 15 out of the 17 um, have signed access agreements. Right. Is there um, any way to, for the, let's say, two people who decide not to do this, and they have such a large train group, um, you know, it's a hundred million dollars, and there's not a lot of them. Is there any way to keep that, those two systems um, in escrow in our town so that if that property <coughs> We could put a restriction on the deed so that um, if, if property does change, that we immediately have to put this in or that it pr protects the new homeowner. Hi. Hi. Bruce Jackson with the town attorney's office. Uh -oh. We're actually trying to avoid putting deed restrictions in. Okay. Part of the reason for that is we don't want to affect people's property values. If I put in a piece of paper on the, your deed that says, by the way, there's a system available, but you don't have it, we're worried it's going to have an adverse effect on value. So by putting an ordinance into Mr. Chase's question, OU2 is something people in town have no idea what it is. All we're trying to do is make a map on the town ordinances that reflects what the EPA is doing so that people in town have a way of looking at what's being done. So don't really want to deed restrict somebody's property. But EPA and DEEP has made it clear that if those people in the future would like a system, then they I'm, could. I'm, I'm not so concerned about those people. I'm concerned about the family that moves from Ohio that Anybody now buys that can, home. They perpetually send letters to the system, people who don't have the system, saying, we and will the money give will you these. 
they're certified letters. There's a whole process of checking. So they're trying, yeah, if somebody comes in two years from now, Deep, uh, Deep would love to come in and put a system in. They want systems in all of the properties. Okay, thank you. It's it's a one. Well, there's also one property owner that I think may end up just outright refusing, which is unfortunate. Ms. Devonta, I come from a slightly different perspective of having been raised in one of the homes that did not have one of these systems in it. So I'm very curious about what the health impacts are if one does not have one of these systems and they need it. And then my second question is, I, and the other perspective I have is as the council person for about half of this area. Um, let me address the first part, the, the, the second part first. Uh, I have heard, I heard from a constituent who was unaware when they purchased their home of the health impacts. Uh, it, it, they were unaware of this whole situation. They purchased their home and then they start getting letters so although I understand the um, effort to uh, keep property values up, I hope we aren't doing something that I would find unconscionable, which is uh, not informing people of the truth of the properties that they would be purchasing. And one of my constituents was not very happy because they had bought their home thinking it was a normal piece of property and then they found that there were potential health impacts. So I guess those two questions are somewhat so, related, or those two concerns, and I have other concerns. So. So, so, so the concern about the person buying a home and not realizing, you know, up until now it has been kind of a caveat emptor, which is a buyer beware, and we don't want that to, to happen. I mean, like to think that I'll be in this job for a while, but, you know, I need to make sure that the knowledge is, or the information is institutionalized which is why we want to have this ordinance so that people know that they have to have a system. And if they don't have a system, there's opportunity, which, you know, I don't want to call it opportunity, but, you know, enforcement to, to make sure that those systems are in place. So when, you know, anytime anyone ever calls our office, I or Olivia, you know, absolutely look up the information and provide them, you know, whatever. But, you know, maybe the young couple from <coughs> Ohio doesn't think to call the health department, um, which is why I want to be able to have, uh, you know, shy of, you know, not having, as Ms. Manis pointed out, you know, uh, a, d a deed restriction. Um, you know, so I don't know. If but this gets to my first question also, which is what is the health impact of these chemicals or vapors that people are breathing in if they don't have this right. system. Right, so, so those... Well, cancer is a very broad thing. I hear my colleagues saying cancer, but that's a very broad thing, so it if is, you could be specific, it, please. It is, it is, it is, it is a broad, it's a broad, um, and part of what um, the EPA did was, or excuse me, the State Health Department did a quantitative risk assessment. They used very um, conservative values and assumptions in assessing one's cancer risk over the lifetime of living in the space, um, uh, living, living, living in that, living in that, in that space. And it was, um, <coughs> based on those, that risk assessment, it met the threshold of EPA to want to take a remedial action. Um, and so while we don't, when we do those quantitative risk assessments, we don't identify specifically, say, lung cancer or breast cancer or you know, it's it's sort of a can looking at a, a cancer risk based on the based on the chemicals toxicity. Um, so how so how much is th is the risk inflated, and how much does this mitigation actually decrease that risk? The I, I believe the systems just as they do with radon they they remove they remove the radon. So the systems in a the home they basically come in and they seal all of the cracks in the basement. They put in a, a suction system, which then pulls the vapors from underneath the home preferentially up to the pipe and then vents to the, to, to the, out, to the outdoors. So that, you know, it should, it should reduce the risk to, uh, you know, to, I won't say to, to zero, zero, but, you know, to, you know, to, to nominal. So if these systems are so effective, it seems that there should be some notification on the title that, uh, you know, just to be honest about what people are purchasing, 
and that there is the system available for free. It's my understanding to everybody. It, there was there was a notation on the field side, which is the town's record. The problem was one of the reasons for this, the EPA wanted this notification in there was we were finding that people weren't looking at the notification. It was there and it very often was being missed. I mean, if you went and called help, so part of when you actually buy a house, we'll do a title search and they'll do a municipal search. The municipal search looks at the health record, but we can't make somebody do a health record search. It's standard practice, but if somebody doesn't, so part of what EPA wanted to do by asking for this was to say, let's put it so it's obvious, but not, we don't want to scare somebody. We want it to be clear, though. It's clear that we can, there is an issue, we can fix it. We just need to make sure that all the people buying in perpetuity know that it's mm -hmm. there. So it wasn't like somebody was hiding it in the past. It's just people weren't catching it. So we wanted to make it a little more, the EPA wants to make it a little more obvious than it has been. Okay, so now in a normal title search that one would do in purchasing a property, this should come up? This should come up. And in fact, we found more than that. What was finding was is that if you knocked a house down and did, uh, build a bu building permit, that the, the building department didn't know about this. So we're tying them all together so that it will come up on any property for anybody going forward. So we don't really want to scare people away because we think the health, the EPA and health thinks that we can make mitigate the problem down to zero. But we also want to make sure somebody is clear about it. So what was done in the past was not perhaps as clear as it should have been, and we're trying to make it a little more clear okay. without scaring anybody. Okay, and if I could ask one more question. Um, the, the, this is an area that um, developers have their eyes on, and there are a couple of planned things already, and one more that a developer's been trying to get through zoning. Could you talk to us about um, you know, one's a storage area, one's apartments, and then there's the uh, site across the street. Can you talk to us about whether that building, that sort of construction, will have any ramifications on the groundwater here? Sure. So the good thing about <coughs> commercial development is that it comes through our office. So all of, you know, I've worked now with Jay Habansky so that any kind of plan comes, comes through our office. And so when they do, either Olivia or I prepare comments. So for instance, um, there was 382 <coughs> and 335 Ferry Boulevard. We made comments to say that for the development, it should not have a um, first floor uh, residence unless you put, in, you put in these systems. So if it's a parking garage that's open, then that's okay. But if it's an enclosed parking garage, then that could potentially, you know, sort of collect the, the vapors, and so that would not be okay. So we, we do have an avenue to make sure that, it, you know, that they're knowledgeable and, um, you know, that, that, you know, I have, a, you know, a say in, 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 that, in that. But the, ac the actual construction process of these sites, will they have any adverse effects on neighbors, on people in the neighborhood? On the neighbors. On the people in these, you know, it's, there's groundwater contamination. Right. And it seems that you'll be, to build these sites, you need a foundation. I mean, I'm not a construction person, so maybe right. my so, question doesn't so make we sense. Spent, but so Olivia and I spent some time with the developer for, which one was that? 382 Ferry, Ferry Boulevard. And they were concerned about that, that, that potential. But the, but the groundwater, at, you know, once it kind of hits the open <coughs> air, I mean, I hate to make this, you know, simplistic, but dilution is the solution to pollution. And so when, you know, you're, you're, you're digging in it, it, it's really no trouble. One of the comments we need um, is that if they access groundwater during the construction process and they have to do dewatering, um, they can't just rid of that water as if it's normal groundwater that they're accessing. They have to go through all the processes to, to, reg to get rid of the water properly. So they can't just dispose of it as if it's normal groundwater. Um, so they would have to follow all the deep and EPA guidelines on, on dealing with that if they were to, if they were to come across it. it they, they could because it is, the groundwater is pretty um, uh, close to the surface since it's close to Housatonic, um, Housatonic River. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much. Mr. Young. Um, I can just go around. But to, to go along with their point, I was at the zoning meetings where these, these were, things were addressed with the Ferry Boulevard apartments. Uh, Mr. Giuliano was very knowledgeable about this. There's a certain level. They cannot dig below. And if they dig below it, there's special things. Just like with Walmart, digging a certain level, it hits groundwater. 
Another thing that happens is that there has to be a tent put up if they do hit groundwater. And there was some question regarding four or five feet. They were saying they were gonna dig nine feet down for the, for the, for the footings. They had to change things because if the footings go too deep, you have the, correct me if I'm wrong, the issue of hitting groundwater. There has to be a tent put up. It becomes a hazardous waste site and it's toxic. And it's very concerning with regards to those projects going on. It's, it's a huge concern. It's been at all the zoning meetings where these projects have come up. That's been a major question from both zoning and from the public. Correct me if I'm wrong, and they've been addressed in the minutes. So, no, if they did, we did talk with Mr. Giuliano, um, and if he did mention that they could potentially go to nine feet. Um, that was what I was just saying, saying before, that if they do access the groundwater, Andrea was saying it's not really a health risk um, when the workers access the groundwater. Um, it's more of breathing in once it, it turns into a vapor. But when it's in groundwater form, um, it's not necessarily a risk right there. Um, so that's what they would need to do is... But is yeah, true. It has to be, um, yeah, it needs, if they're dewatering and they need to get rid of the groundwater, that's when they need to, I don't know that they necessarily need to have tents up and everything like that. I don't, I'm not really exactly sure of, of what they would need to, exactly what they need to do, but they, I know that they just can't get rid of it uh, like normal water. Tom, did you have anything? Yes. Tom? Thank you. Um, likely for Bruce, but um, my questions will be around uh, changes in the ownership. Uh, people, current owners or future owners, what are the changes in their obligations? There's a, a particular paragraph that speaks of agencies will have the right to inspect any building or property. So the way the way the EPA was said it was, and if you notice, like the penalty was from the date of the determination that the system is not working. So let's say you have a house and you decide to replace the siding true story actually. So you replace the siding in your house, you take the system off. What if you don't put it back on? And what they, what, what EPA and DEEP wanted to do was to come in and say, remember these are not internal systems. They want to walk up in your yard and inspect it. They're not going into your house. They're not invading your privacy. So if they go in and realize that the system is not working, if it's a failure of the system, they'll come fix it. But if you remove the siding and forgot to put it on, they want to put you on notice. And then we had a discussion with them about the penalty phase, which was from notice to the homeowner. Because I don't want homeowner A to take the system off and then sell the house and homeowner B not know that the system exists. So e deep in EPA wanted the ability to say, if it's determined that it's not running, they will give you notice. If you ignore the notice, then they have the right to penalize you. But that's if you've ignored the notice. They'll allow them to come back onto the property and make the system functional. So having the right to inspect any system that may be functioning at a decreased capacity and then require compliance, would that require, say, an easement versus a deed restriction? Let me ask you a question. Do you have, you have water at your house, right? Mm -hmm. And when does, do you know when an aquarium comes up and tests the water? There's a little black thing on the side of your house. They come up and put a meter on it. They walk on your yard. Implicit in, this, in using this, uh, this, the services is they have the right to come touch the outside of your house, measure your water content. Same thing with the electric company. When they want to look at the meter, what do they do? They walk up the side of the house. They don't enter the house, but they enter onto the yard. Okay. And rather than the, what this will do is allow the, the public in general to have a notice of the fact that if you're in this area, they have the right to come look. You don't have to be home. You don't have to talk to them. You don't have to touch them. But they're trying, EPA and DEEP is trying to make sure that what your question was is if these properties ever get transferred, they want to know in perpetuity or until that remediation is completed that there's no question in the mind, public of the, the mind of the public but that this is functioning and, and you know viable to her point if it's if they want if you're living in the house and you want to make sure you're safe wouldn't you want deep to come make sure that if your system's functioning at full capacity because you wouldn't know all you know is the thing runs on the outside if it wasn't functioning you want them to come in and say we notice you're fixed functioning at 50 percent capacity remember we could be dealing with 30, 40, 50 years from now. These all machines break. They do do a site. Uh, they do do a site. Deep does a site visit every five years. They issue a letter saying, okay, "Have that your was system. The next question. We're going to come through. You know, check it out." And then every other year, in those intervening four years, they get a letter. Uh, they will get a letter. We haven't started yet, but um, from the health department, saying, "Just want to remind you because we were concerned that someone would move, not share, and then." 
the, and that's why perhaps your person that you talked about was starting to get these letters because it was the five-year review. So they were getting letters from um, EPA and DEP saying, hey, just want to remind you, you have a system. Make sure it's working. If it's not, call deep. <laughs> and uh, for any property uh, modified or constructed after the effective date of the ordinance, it requires the system. <laughs> Is that not an obligation that the current property owners are not held to? And is that okay? Well, the idea, she was saying that if, they, if you had a house down there and you knocked it down and built two or whatever, knocked it down and built a bigger one, they're saying if, if they're imposing upon a building contractor and the building department that part of the CO requirements are going to be if you take a house down that has a system, you must put a house back on that has a system. They don't want, they want you to make sure that the system is in place whenever. Uh, apartments would be commercial, so I assume that you, if, what's the requirement on, on the system to be for a multi-unit apartment? It just says interior living space. Yeah. It, I think it, if it's new, it would depend on how it's, how it's developed, because it, I wouldn't want to have it developed where it's, you know, we have residences on the, on the first floor. If you did, then they would have to have those systems in. And I don't, and from an engineering standpoint, that's not my area of expertise, so I don't know how that would actually be put in place. If I, if I may, people all heard about radon and if they buy and sell houses or they hear about people having radon. This is, as she said, this is just a souped up radon system. It does the same thing as radon does. What's that? <laughs> it, <laughs> I mean, it really, so, so what they're trying to do is take a normal radon system and make sure that all of the air in the basement or it could even could potentially have any of these vapors is is pushed out nobody's 100 percent sure what's in the ground nobody's ever going to know until they get through there the whole idea is to keep the public safe without scaring anybody because it's not you know they 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 epa and deep have got a pretty good handle on what this is they just want to make sure everybody's protected um, yeah it was under section six paragraphs D and E, just if it's okay to require a system on every building going forward, but you're not requiring it on every existing building, that's okay. Well, but what they're saying here is, what well, they're talking about living space and non-living space. Um, it, what we tried to do is, her point to a parking garage. Should a parking garage be built, you don't need a system because it's open. So. Basically, they're talking about, let's, let's look at, like, C, um, each building residence use containing an indoor living space as well as an indoor living space connected to an outdoor living space. But then they're exempting out things that might not. Deep is saying, well, the parking garage doesn't need it. So we're, tr we're trying not to capture every building if there's no engineering reading, me reason for it. I, I was trying to delineate buildings that existed before the ordinance and the buildings after the ordinance. If they met these definitions, they're not required to put in a system. But if they're built, modified, or constructed after the ordinance, then we are requiring the system. They don't have an opt-out like if, the if current. They, if they currently, if, if they are, if they don't need a system today, but change themselves to require a system, they don't have an opt-out. I'm, I'm good. Thank you. Okay. A um, couple questions. You guys have uh, answered a lot of my questions already, and thank you all for coming out. I really appreciate it. Um, currently, I mean, it seems like this is the intent of this is to give us some kind of a, a weight in which to make sure that these houses going forward have these systems. Correct. Okay. Where in the past it was kind of done on a voluntary basis and that kind of thing. So this Correct. is kind of going towards the future, looking at it and saying, okay, everybody's got to have this and giving you some kind of recourse in which to work with. Correct. That's, that's what I'm getting at. Um, so I, I, you know. In terms of that, I think that this is a good thing. Um, in terms of the inspections, one of the things I was wondering about is now they've got to have records on all the, the DEP is keeping records on all these things that they have been keeping for the last 15 or 18 years, whatever, right? Correct? That's my understanding is that Ron Curran, when you talk to him, is, is down here regularly and drives by and he can tell you which systems are working and which isn't. He's, he's and it, DEEP is here to say, we, it, if you don't know your system's not working, there's no penalty. If, 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 it, if it just died one night, not a problem. But if he's, 
if it's a free upgrade to fix it and you refuse to do it, that's when he wants to do it. Because what he's worried about is you don't want your system, you don't, and then you sell your house. And now we have, we're perpetuating the same problem we're all concerned about. We don't want to have somebody buying a house without it. And we're also tying more closely the health department and the building department, DEP, or DEEP, and EPA, so that we have a consistent process to say, if you buy in this area, we can protect you from any potential groundwater vapors that could possibly be coming into that house. Just taking that a little bit further, are there <coughs> a specific set of fees or whatever that this would be then required if people pay for offenses against this? You know, if, if they're in not in compliance and it's shown that it's their fault, is there like a certain amount of money I that they have to pay? I think a fee, uh, a penalty fee of $250 a day. Is that what it is? And it would be from the day, so, you know, we're driving around and you don't notice it and then, you know, wow. four weeks later, you well, notice okay. that, uh, you know, there's a system that is is off, um, then that 9D that yeah. then says that then we, so that would be, say, June 1st, and then we would work from there. Now, people can't, I think we have a provision in there that says that if you're going to do a project, you know, you can let us, let us, or is it just, is it just us, or is it? the multiple agencies let someone know that hey you know I'm about to do a siding project it's going to take three weeks they're going to have to take it down you know I mean it's not mm -hmm. like we're the radon police or the radon right. system police right. but <coughs> this, is, this is not to, to penalize somebody who doesn't have a system really it's to say okay we notice it's not going we want to come fix it and you say no I'm not worried about the person who says no I'm worried about the person six months later who buys and doesn't realize the system's not working and doesn't know who to call. Remember, DEEP is maintaining these. It's mm -hmm. not a homeowner expense. So $250 a day sounds onerous, but it's after we've given you six notices so somebody will keep, fix it for free. Yeah. DEEP wanted to make sure that they had your undivided attention if you're really just gonna totally ignore them. And, and we get calls, so we got a call just uh, two weeks ago of a, a woman who said, there's an alarm going off in my basement. And so, you know, I called Ron Curran and you know so when they're not operational in a perfect world that you know the alarm should go off and there's a number that says that they should either call us or call call deep so it's Ms. Santezzo let's um, just keep going around I, I have a question about um, this is the vapor systems also it's F it says the operation of any soil vapor mitigation system may be temporarily suspended for minor repairs and it goes on to say th that the re improvements should be something less, less than 30 days. But then it says, provided that the operation of such system shall be restarted upon completion of work and in no event shall the suspension of the operation of such system continue, suspension of the operation of such system continue beyond 30 days. My question is, theoretically you could wait five years for the exam, how would, how would is there any way of knowing that they've turned off the system. If I may, the, the, the idea was if you're going to do construction in your house, we want you to be able to shut it down for a period of time without any penalties. But no, it's just just saying if it, you ask, tell, tell the deep that you're going to shut it down, you tell them the length of the uh, shutdown. Oh, you Third, tell them. You tell them. You're gonna, you're gonna, what, what we want is impose to somebody, I'm going to reside my house. Fine, shut the system down, take it down. 30 days. And Deep is saying, if you need 45 days, you need 60 days, tell us. But at the end of that period of time, then you, they have an obligation to put it back on and make it and get it running, and Deep will help with that. Again, the idea would be you can't take the system down forever and just forget about it. If you take the system down, and, and remember, the, the penalties, by the way, is from notice. So if, if you take it down and forget to tell Deep, and Deep finds it out five years later, the penalty starts when Deep figures it out. Now, Deep is pretty sure they're not going to wait that long, but the idea is to make sure that we're not penalizing somebody who doesn't, who's an innocent, but to somebody who takes it down and just intentionally forgets to put it back up is the person they're looking at. So you can tell Deep you want it for 75 days, and as long as they say sure, that's fine. And we also added into, the, into it, if, if you're doing something, if you're doing, like, geothermal heat is exempted out. Why? Because they said maybe that's okay. And if you find something you need to do that, that you go to deep and say, 
you get with a deep EPA and you and, and health. If you go to deep EPA and health and say, I've got this project that's going to pierce the water system, I want you to approve. And if all three agencies approve, then you're exempted out. So we're trying to take into all possibilities. Remember, they're going to be reading this 100 years from now. And so we're trying to take into consideration anything that would be reasonable. If, if everybody agrees it's reasonable to, cut, to, to give you an exemption from the ordinance, then you get an exemption. Mr. Church? <coughs> These uh, systems were installed 12 to 15 years ago. Um, has there been any reduction in the um, vapor contaminants since that time? In other words, do they do periodic measurements? In other words, is the hazard the same today as it was in 2003? Right. They do not do indoor air assessments. So there's no, you know, I, I don't have a way of knowing that unless the homeowner is doing the uh, sampling. Um, part of that is a little complicated because um, one of the compounds that they were using to track or, or, you know, to evaluate the health risk was benzene. But benzene is not a compound that's um, been found in the Raymark waste. Um, and they realized that it was um, compounds that are related to household items. Um, in fact, one um, place was that, the, that they were storing a um, gasoline, I mean, a gas-powered lawnmower right next to where they were actually, on the other side of the door, right where they are taking samples. So at this point, they don't, there is no, um, you know, air monitors. So I, really don't, I really can't answer that. So we don't know if there's any, been any reduction in the hazard, the vapor hazard, since 2003 is what you're saying. In the, in the, in the well, there, ha there has been reduction in the, in the water. In the, I'm sorry. In the ground I know I'm asking about specifically about the vapor. Right. Groundwater is fluid, so you can have, even if we were to do testing, you know, we could have one house that came up positive five years ago, and then the groundwater is fluid. So it I'm not asking about groundwater, I'm asking about no, the vapor. The vapor would then. Is it in the groundwater? The vapor comes from the groundwater, okay. so you can have a home that was positive, that um, had elevated levels five years ago, and then test it now, and it might not. Um, and it, it could fluctuate, and then in five years, it could be positive, it could have elevated levels again. So it's just kind of hard to. Why would it fluctuate? I'm um, just that's the way the groundwater moves. Mm -hmm. um, and um, there's, na there's natural accumulation. I mean, the, the, the volatile organic compounds are in the groundwater. They mm -hmm. want to stay in the water phase. They want to escape. You know, so when they're going underneath the house, they're going to mm -hmm. escape off the groundwater into the soil particles, and then you know, potentially go. They want to take the path of least resistance. So mm -hmm. underneath the home, and you have a crack in your basement, they're going to go up these tracks. But if you take to your field. Okay. Um, my next question is to the uh, town attorney. Um, I'd like to go back to these zones again. Are these EPA defined zones? Okay. Yes, so so therefore, they fall, fall under federal. Re these are set up under federal regulation. I believe that that they, they if they're if, it's, if they're defining this by the OU2, then yes, it's under federal. Okay. Have you looked at the federal regulations to see what I, any, uh, what else might be required or could be required in the future based on these federal regulations? In other words, have you looked at the federal regulations as it relates to these zones? I've looked at the federal relations as it, it deals with the OUs, OU2, 3, and 6, for instance. I guess I'm not understanding the question. Are you wondering whether EPA can require additional actions within the zone, or are you concerned about uh, EPA you have federal regulations EPA mm -hmm. has set up and defined these zones right all right so there's a series of requirements under each zone under the, these two zones there's a series of requirements under the OU zone but they can't the federal government can't dictate to the town I mean that's this is the, the federal government's attempt to dictate to the town mm -hmm. what an ordinance would be so can they go beyond this without council's approval no so this, the only thing that this had to do was with it, they defined the exterior and, and uh, circumference of the area by their OU designations for the EPA cleanup. Mm -hmm. But it, even if there were federal, I mean, I have looked at the regulations creating the OU zones, mm -hmm. but even if there were additional 
things that would require under federal government, they can't dictate to the town without the council's approval. really been in the making for about, I'd say, at least five years, and working with EPA and DEEP and two generations of, of uh, town attorneys, um, mm -hmm. so that I think that we, you know, we, we, we have looked at, you know, what the Im impact is, and in, in knowing, you know, I think from a regulation standpoint, OU2 is designated as an operable unit of the Raymark Industries Superfund site. Mm -hmm. So those are the regulations that um, that, are, that come to bear. I don't know if they're deep or not. Well, it, it, so the only time we reference to the OU2 is in the, the beginning of it, because that's only telling us where our space is. OU2 may change or, or not, but right now this, this, this ordinance, if passed, would designate a particular area, and that's why we attach the maps. We're saying, okay, here's the area. If they want to, if, if EPA wants to come in and expand the area significantly, they're going to have to change, come and change the ordinance before it affects the average person in town, mm -hmm. which is why we added the map. We defined the area. Okay. And my last question is um, to Adrian. Um, I'm sorry, Andrea. Um, I'm just curious. You say here... A look back when the systems were installed in 2003 through 2005, home values did not suffer because of system installation. How do you know that? I'm not being tough on you, but I'm, I'm very well, I, concerned I, about this regulation. Right. I mean, looking, looking at, uh, you know, home sales in terms of, you know, how quickly they sold. Um, I'm not an appraiser by training, so, I mean, it was a sort of a cursory look. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I, my concern was um, for property values, and EPA has done some research, not in Stratford, and looking at like a super fun site. You know, back in 1991, when we had enormous amounts, or 93, 94, 95, we had enormous amounts of activity. Um, you know, you, some homes, in fact, probably may have may have dipped a little, and then after the sort of the, you know, pun intended, but this dust settled, um, and then you know, moving on, then how, home values were, were back up. Okay, thank you. Ms. Mass? Um, one of the things that you can kind of measure with regards to what Mr. Chase was saying, if the hazard has gone away, is your number of victims impacted by the, 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 the health causes. And I'm just wondering, I know the health causes are not being settled or anything, but is anybody looking over at Housatonic Avenue regarding uh, deaths according to these specific cancers that are related to this. For example, brain cancers, um, you know, there's some people that have died of some funky stuff in Stratford that are around these things. We can't tie it to it, but it would be nice to know. Right. I mean, looking, looking at, so we have looked at cancer rates um, over probably 42 years mm -hmm. worth of data um, and, you know, have not found that there are elevated rates. I, it's really difficult to just sort of narrow in because of the small numbers if we were just to look at that that neighborhood mm -hmm. you know those those are those are are difficult but i mean those kinds of questions have been raised and that's why um you know we've continued to uh you know to look at that so meg harvey who's at the state mm -hmm. health department asked most recently um lou concalves to um, evaluate cancer rates to specifically in stratford mm -hmm. and we did not find um is specific you know, to those areas regarding all of Stratford and then ad right. hoc in those smaller areas. Yeah, right? it's 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 very it's very challenging to to be able to look at those those small numbers because mm -hmm. you know unfortunately the American cancer statistics have us, you know, one in three, you know, are diagnosed with cancer over his or her lifetime. Yeah. Um, and so it's very difficult to you know to be able to, to, to separate that out. But that's why that is why we want to have those systems, you know, put in place. That's why the EPA, you know, if I get on my little soapbox, but, mm -hmm. you know, why EPA wants to take, you know, continue to take um, action to remove, remove potential exposure. And we tend to blame working class lifestyles, right, don't we? <laughs> Not you, but in general. Um, the EPA regulations were mentioned. I have one, two more questions. This is one of them. EPA regulations were part of this. Um, the EPA is going through some changes at the federal level, obviously, right? There are some major changes being proposed. 
how will this ordinance protect Stratford from those possible uh, deregulation? So some of this stuff may not be under their purview anymore. Will we still get funding? Will this ensure that the EPA follows through on their promise to Stratford? Or are we looking at federal changes that will just kind of wipe this slate clean and leave our people? First, I would say, really, EPA is the motivator, but DEEP is the policeman on this one. Mm -hmm. So it's not it's func a focus of EPA regulation changing or, or the, the people changing. Basically, Ron Curran from Connecticut DEEP is the person really checking it. And his point is the funding to put the machines in is in place. Um, and they've even, I think he even said he got funding going forward. So they can't take it from us, in they, other they words. They cannot take it from us, and it's in place. And that understanding, and part of by putting this ordinance in place, we're sort of saying Stratford is recognizing this effort. And whether we modify this or not, we're sort of we're codifying our mm -hmm. understanding and reliance on them to maintain them. We're agreeing to designate this area and say it. And the idea is, to your point, which was we want to make sure that somebody going forward, I mean, we're not trying to hurt anybody. We're trying to help them. And if the idea is to protect somebody from having a conveyance without notice, this is one of the ways to create notice so that everybody's under the same understanding. At the same time, relieving people of the concern. Okay, there's groundwater there, but we can show these systems function, and if and if it doesn't, the state will come in and fix it, rather than having it fail and not having any plan in place. And my last question deals with that, with regards to conveyance. So, if you don't have a vapor mitigation system, why? Because this is so important. Why are we not telling people that if you don't do this, we're putting it on your deed? Like, it's either or. Like, why are we not doing that with with you, you, these people to so that this? Because so, my kids go over to play. My niece goes to play at that house. They don't have a vapor mitigation system. You know, I've, I've been over in that area. These are kids who play in and out of each other's homes. Families visit one another. You know, one person's problem is everybody's problem. But when you send your niece over, you don't check the land records, right? So right. the idea is not to have it that individual. Now, I, we, I, I understand that. What I'm saying is why not compel every single person to put this on their home? We are, we are certainly attempting to do that. The key for me would be once I put a deed, first thing, a deed restriction has to be conveyed by them. We don't own it, so we have to lien their house. Mm -hmm. it's, not a, it's not a deed restriction. We're going to put a lien on, like a blight lien. Mm -hmm. You don't do this, we're going to lien you. So we can certainly add to the to do that, but we're kind of hoping to get them with a little bit of honey rather than vinegar. Mm -hmm. so the idea is to put some honey in to say, okay, it's out there. And by the way, we're going to, everybody in town, here it is, and we're going to show you what a great system it is. Mm -hmm. You can always decide later to change, the, to change it to say, and if you don't do that, we're going to lean you for the failure to do it. But remember, this is, we, I have no method of leaning them without an ordinance being in place because I have no, I haven't violated anything. Right now, it's a state program that they're voluntarily added to. And we figured out some people weren't. We're trying to get them on. I don't also want to lean somebody's property and hurt their value unless there's some real need. So you need an ordinance to do that. Yeah. I need something to do it. I mean, think about it. What, uh, I right. can blight somebody's house if the blight officer determines there's blight and, and tells me right. that there's blight. I have nothing to do right now to force somebody I, to do it. And I get that if it's broken. I'm concerned about that one or two people who decide, I don't want this. And they continue to say, I don't want it. And they're taking their own. It's dangerous, and it's been proven dangerous. Why are we not doing something to, so like if I don't if I don't if I don't follow my rules for my health care at work I have to pay like a thousand dollars because I chose not to follow the health regulations that are set up in my HEP program like why are we not saying hey you live on toxic waste this is important it's for your own good we have to have you do this for the safety of yourself neighbors and the future of Stratford so there are two homes that are like kind of on the fence and the one homeowner his issue is that he doesn't want people in his house while he's not there. And so I'm trying to, you know, work. So I, I, feel, I feel pretty confident that, you know, and he knows about this mm -hmm. system. I mean, he's, you know, he's been in town for a long, long time. The other one has been fairly reticent to even want to discuss it. I mean, Olivia's been out there three or four times. Deep's been out there three or four times. And so now what we... You know, we've started the conversation to say, well, you know, 
the town is looking at uh, an ordinance that could compel you to do this because if you don't then you'll be in oh, violation and could and and could you know be up to you know two hundred fifty children dollars. living in that home? Can I just ask? I don't know. All right, because this this stuff impacts kids. I, That's what we've been told by Raymark over and over. Right. I I I can't imagine that uh, you know a family with kids not wanting to, to do this. I just think you know not for nothing and 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 may he rest in peace. But George Mulligan had a system in his home. Mm -hmm. And it was very difficult to get into his home for all kinds of reasons. Excuse and me. and <laughs> and I, I mean no disrespect. And he, he had work done on his home and it took him eighteen months with Ron Curran, you know, bugging him and you know, us mentioning it to him to put that system back on mm -hmm. on on place. And I you know, so I'm I'm hopeful that we can get to this person, but with this ordinance in place, then I think we have some some okay. teeth, local teeth that we can compel. So I, I really appreciate your, you know. Ms. Defonte. Thank you. Um, I, I hope that you can give people a better answer as to how much of a cancer risk this reduces than what I got. Because if I was a homeowner and you couldn't tell me what this is doing, I would be disappointed and not a big believer in this. So again, I'm going to ask the question, what is the risk of cancer in these homes um, that requires such a system? And, and, the question, and the answer to the question also hasn't been that this is. So there was indoor air testing done only at a few of these homes. Um, most of the homes have them in kind of pre preventatively. We're not sure if there's elevated levels. We know that the groundwater is impacted. Um, so we're having this whole area of homes have systems in whether we know they have vapor in their homes or not. Um, so you know, the, all the homes are going to be different um, depending on where they're located. Um, not all of them. How old they are? Right. OK, but I mean, um, there's got to be some quantification of this, no? Yeah, so okay. Are we talking about three times, four times, one and a half times? I have no well, idea. From a statistical standpoint, so I know as a social scientist, you can appreciate having to. <laughs> yeah, with, with and I've run the regret. I've run regressions, not just on just right. not on this. So. And so and so part of part of EPA has. How can I find this? You know, believe that the, the cancer risk was in the realm where EPA takes action, which is uh, two or three cancers per. So I think you're asking us to solve a problem, and I'm not under, I mean, I, I understand what you're seeing the problem as, is, is that people don't want these systems, but the broader problem is that there's a health risk. So what is this health, what is the health risk so if you don't have the system? <coughs> oh, here we go. Uh, no, that's the, it's, it's that. So six, six, so they, they looked at it based on four different chemicals, um, and for instance, six of the homes had um, exceedances for one particular compound. Um, in another compound, they had, you know, one of the 12 of them exceeded it. You know, I'm not answering your question. I'm just, I gotta try and find that. Where, because she, they calculated, why don't I have it in? I had it here. Well, the, and I can actually, I can give you the numbers that I have in my head. Um, all the different ones that you mentioned are like one on five, at least on, on our website. Um, and so, as you indicated, they, they tested, you know, several homes. The, the cancer risk, which is, a, which is a, a probability of developing cancer over a 30 year lifetime being exposed to the concentrations that they had measured and that they used in the calculations. And um, I don't know why I can't find the, because these are the, the samples. It doesn't matter. We still have the cancer. Or well, have the well, no, it does matter. I mean, it, it, yeah, I, 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 so, I mean so, so, so EPA typically 
takes action when the cancer risk is one in 100,000. That means if, if you were looking at a population of 100,000 people and one person got a cancer, you know, extra <coughs> cancer, then, then they would take action. And so these cancers were um, 3.2 times 10 to the minus 5 and 2.6 times 10 to the minus 5. So that's 3.2 cancers in 100,000 or two and a half cancers um, uh, not cancer. I'm on that page. 4.6 excess cancers so in 100,000 exposed individuals. Right, right. So it is a small so it's, increase. So it's right, but it's, it's not. Yeah. You know, and we don't have 100,000. You know, so the, our population is isn't 100,000. But you know, you want to be able to take an action, a remedial action, if the the the, the cancer, and it's, and it's a probability. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, it's theoretical, it's based on conservative assumptions that you're going to live in that home for 30 years um, and you're going to live where the concentration that they, that they took in the basement, and not everyone lives in their basement, I, I get that, but you want to be, you want to be conservative. And so, you know, it was difficult comparing, um, you know, like the soil gases just in the, you know, in the yard to the values in the home because the homes are all different. I mean, some of them, I mean, if it was like my house, was, which was built in 1927, 19, uh, you know, I've got a leaky basement and, you know, cracks all around, but. Um, okay, can, can I just ask though, so uh, reading, just taking a look at this, it says, while theoretical risks are not high enough to trigger immediate action in any location, so that gives us some, you know, some reason to be calm about this. But then I'm looking at the proposed ordinance where uh, the fine, you know, one thing that kind of disturbs me with this proposed ordinance is let's say you're a homeowner and you, you know, you bought the home, you paid for it, this is your property, you simply may not want it and to me that's your choice. So to see this fine of $250 a day imposed, couldn't somebody sign a waiver? instead of having a fine imposed? I mean, if you're of your right mind, you say the cancer risk here. Well, the cancer risks are, 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 I suppose, on a relative scale lower, but you don't know what the impact is of a young child being exposed at an okay, early Okay, so, so let's say early, you're somebody. Age. So, that, so, that, uh, so as a new person, an, you know, a young family coming to, right. you know, coming to Stratford, I would want to know. No, no, Andrea, I would too. But let's say I'm an older homeowner and you don't, don't want it in my right. in, in my house, and I'm a property owner. Don't I have the right to say what happens to my property and sign a waiver rather than being fined two hundred and fifty dollars a day? Uh, it, to their point, that's what's sort of happening now. We we came to you for your thoughts. This is, as we said, motivated by the EPA. So if yeah. you wanted to, for instance. That actually is watered down from what EPA wanted. Um, if you wanted to allow a waiver, I would only ask that if you ask to change it to put a waiver in, that there be some trigger that on the sale of your house. Yes, so I agree. That we don't have, we don't perpetuate the problem. I agree. So, so the idea would be EPA is just trying to say they're protecting not the person there today, they're protecting the future. Um, right. And so, you know, the idea would be feel free to modify the ordinance, we're coming to you for your, for your input, um, just make it so that we don't create this going forward. Okay, so 9B on this ordinance, um, we could modify and instead have a trigger, because two, 250 a day, at least in today's dollars, seems like a tremendous amount of money. Well, it um, was, and EPA really wanted to make sure that, that they, they dealt with the person who just wanted to ignore it. Um, yeah. EPA was really worried about that. Deep was worried about that. Um, but again, that's well, what we came to you. You can, right. you can modify it any way you want. Well, personally, I would keep A and C, which means that the town could bring appropriate or necessary action. Um, but the fine, I just think, is uh, it's not a matter of dollars. I just think it's the wrong approach. And then my second, my other question is this: the money. These systems are being paid by a Raymark fund, so, and they're electrical systems, right? So the, the, the homeowner, so that's a good question. The homeowner is responsible for running the, running the system, so they pay for the electricity. 
which I'm told is approximately the same cost of running a light bulb 24-7, 365. Okay, which can be, you know, can add up. Um, is there, I mean, when, you, when we talk about carrots rather than sticks, is there no way to make, to, I, I don't, I mean, the fund has a tremendous amount of money in it, no? And can't we make this more enticing to people, like essentially pay, give them an, a financial incentive to put a system into their home? I mean, right now you're running system, electricity, this, they have to pay for it. The system, the system putting in, I mean, these systems range, you know, are highly engineered radon systems, and they cost between, I'd say, three and $12,000, depending on depending on how leaky, how leaky, you know, your, your, your basement, uh, your basement is. Mm -hmm. And so to have the, to, to, to your question, yes, there's a fund. Yes, it has money in it, but it's not, may not even have enough money to, you know, finish out what we have to do other than these systems. And so I, okay. Is there, is I don't, if the fund, so it's, I understand your point. Is there enough money in that fund to pay for these systems in perpetuity? They're they're already. I don't understand that in perpetuity. Well, they they're break, not. They're not. They're not going to. They break. They're perpetuity. not going to. They're not going to pay their electric bills. Mm -hmm. um, if they break, then they need to be replaced. I mean, EPA's and D, excuse me, DEEP, who's the holds the maintenance contract. They're going to have to, you know, continue to, 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 to pay for that. Now, whether or not they actually pay for it out of a Raymark fund or not, I don't know. Um, but you know, their job is to protect the environment. So, you know, okay. But the plan is forever and ever these systems will be right. paid because for. Because unfortunately, they're going to need to be in place for a long time. Okay. Mr. Chair, I'd like to make an amendment to this ordinance, um, which is to remove section B. 9B. So, well, why? Mr. Chairman, I'll second for discussion purposes only. Okay. Uh, Mr. Chair? What was the amendment? Uh, with the Could you state the amendment, please? The amendment is to remove uh, section 9B from the ordinance. Hi. Um, I believe that this, the ordinance was put together over the past umpteen years and um, five years, generations of people longer than I've been around. Um, and I'm not going to support any changes to it. I'm also hesitant to support any changes to it with the counselor who's the majority of this area currently on vacation and he's, he's not here. So um, I don't even know if and we can only talk about the amendment. I'm saying voting on the amendment, voting on this. I'm not even sure, like, that's a good idea without him present to ask some questions. And I'm wondering if he's asked any questions regarding those fees and if we can keep it to the amendment. But um, with regards to changing it and looking at the number of people here, I'm not supporting any changes to what's been prepared because I just, I think that they've worked too long. And I know what Mr. we went through with Mr. Mulligan and he took it off his house and he wasn't going to put it back on. And that opens the window for that kind of stuff to continue to happen. And I think that that's what that B was for, was to close that. So I'm, I'm concerned to kind of move anything because I think it shifts the whole reason. So. I'm not going to my, my comment on the uh, <coughs> amendment is that we'll be taking the teeth out of the uh, whole ordinance. And I don't think that's a good idea. I think we have to, in some instances, you have to push people, and that I'm hoping the notification would be uh, prompt, uh, but that's, that's what makes it tough right there, so and could enforces I just, it. Uh, okay, so, I, so while I appreciate your concern, I have found in, you know, being the director of health since 2010, um, that it is 
unfortunately, having penalties and fines um, are actually, uh, I don't want to call them incentives, but that's kind of how you get, so, you know, I'll come up soon with looking at our nail and hair and barbershop um, ordinance changes, and I'm going to suggest to have some, you know, fines to really motivate people to come into compliance, because unfortunately, uh, you know, people aren't in the goodness of their hearts saying, oh, yeah, i got to put that system together. Um, I don't know if you would be, be amenable to having a lesser than 250 a fee, but I, f I do feel that there's, you know, it's important to have some kind of, you know, I don't want to call it fear factor, but, you know, to, 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 to motivate people to, like, this is important. Because I, I have had conversations with people who say, oh, yeah, I have a system in my home, but my husband doesn't like it, so he makes me turn it off. <laughs> I mean, I suppose that's your choice, but. One, one other, if you're going to amend, one other idea is to, to leave the discretion of the fine to the health department director. Say, if the health department director in he or she's wisdom believes a fine should be imposed, that gives you a human being to look at a situation in which perhaps a fine might not be appropriate. I tend to agree that without any teeth, I mean, I look at our personal property with our restaurants in town, and if, if you don't pay your personal property, you don't get a license. If you don't pay your personal property, you don't re renew your registration. I can tell you from doing some of that, nobody would pay their personal property if we didn't have something to compel them. So my thought is maybe loosen it a little bit to, to suggest that, you know, an, a, an enforcement person of some sort is the one who in, decides on the imp imposition of a fine rather than an automatic thing. Mr. Fonte? Is $7,000 a month for a fine is truly excessive, and it would put many people, I think, into foreclosure. I mean, this is a ridiculous fine, $7,000 a month. I can't think of any fines that we have anywhere near that amount of money. So even suggesting that amount of money, I think, was well, uh, really quite high. Huh? One thing that should be noticed it's is seven, up two fifty a day. <laughs> yeah, if I may, it's up, number one, it's up to. Keep in mind, DEEP and EPA have fines of $25,000 a day. So this is down from what they were looking for. But these are people who didn't pollute. It, we're suggesting that we're, we're here before the committee just to, ha to take your input. So right, we're right. Not, we're not saying this is it, take it or leave well, it. Well, actually, so, we're, yeah. So if you have a... Re if I, I understand we can amend, but I just want to point out again, I, you know, I, as a homeowner, maybe because I live in the historic district and I know how these sorts of... Um, community obligations are, uh, it may be that you, a homeowner may decide that they want to turn their system off for some time, maybe they're away for a long time, um, or that they don't want the system for whatever reason. I just think that homeowners should have some right to be able to say what they do with their house as long as they're fully cognizant of the risks that they're taking. But. Mr. Chase? Yeah. Um, I just want to point out in <coughs> section B, <coughs> excuse me, uh, the wording is uh, violation may be right. fined and the amount not to exceed 250. So it's not a shall, mm -hmm. uh, it's a may, which does leave it to the discretion, I assume at this point, of the health director. The idea of putting may in versus shall was specific to allow some flexibility up to, you know, not to be allowed some flexibility. Mm -hmm. the, the attempt was to make it sort of reasonable to the circumstances in whoever was judging it at the time. So the health department at the time of the violation would have a great deal of say. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I'd like to call a question. <coughs> so called. Um, all in favor? Of the amendment? No, no, we're voting to call the question. Oh, voting to call the question. Yeah, right. Uh, all in favor of calling the question? Aye. All not in favor? No. 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 The chair says no. We're going to talk some more. Mr. Chair? <laughs> yes. So the reason, Ms. Antezzo, um, I didn't vote for that is because I think we need further amendment on this amendment in order to support it. I think a compromise was suggested regarding, and I think the shall not exceed up to, I will share this with you. I lived in a house 
for 38 years, I lived here for 38 years. I've lived in the same house for over, gosh, 20 something, 30. My parents own that home. You guys came out every summer if we didn't open our pool on time and you gave them a citation. It was $100 a day. And like clockwork, the pool either got opened or we went out and bought the mosquito tabs. It reminds people of what's, what the health risks are. And my dad went, oh, I got to do that. And or else they're going to find me. And people with blight, it's the same thing happening. Blight used to exist up by where I lived a lot. And uh, the blight officer's been coming out. And you see things being taken care of. So there is some truth to what you're saying mm -hmm. with what the health department's doing. I think we need to talk right now and if we can come to an agreement of what the new wording would be that would satisfy Mr. Ponte, I think that I'd be more than agreeable to vote on something like that to, to change, to amend this. But I don't want to take the teeth away from it. It's open to, to do that. It to what? Well, she wanted to amend it to take the price, the, the cost away completely. That's the amendment that we're voting on is to take the fine away completely. And I don't think anybody's in favor of that, but I know Ms. Ponte is not in favor of the $250. So I don't know, do we need to weigh in on this so that the thing can pass? There's only six of us here. But I don't think, I don't think the 250 is in stone. It's, first of all, it's May. It leaves it to the discretion of the health director. It Am doesn't I say, it, it's it may, may be fine in the amount not to exceed. I mean, could she less. could determine that the family can't afford 250 a day and it should be, I'm, you I'm know, willing to work with $25 it, a day. It, this, it does not say who will determine that. It just says that it's the town of Stratford, so it could be anybody. We could propose that it would be. Concern, you could propose yeah. that as part of your amendment yeah. that the health director may, you can, no. Mm -hmm. I, I propose I a friendly amendment mm -hmm. to your amendment, if I may, mm -hmm. um, to institute that be the health director that assigns that um, at the discretion of the health director, I guess, would be to amend to yours if you'd accept that friendly amendment. That's fine with me. But that takes out the $250 a day. I'm, I'm amending? No, it's just the amendment. It's up to 250 a day at the discretion of the health okay. director. The amendment is now changed to include the health directors for us to be to determined. It would determine a fine of up to $250 a day. Second. All in our discussion? I'd, I'd like to know if that satisfies yeah, that's fine. your concern. Yeah, that's fine. At least fine. there's a person behind it now. Thank you. Discussion? Any more discussion? No. All in favor? Aye. 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 The amendment. Can we call the question on the main question now? Yes. The motion to, oh, no, I'm sorry, I withdraw <laughs> that. I withdraw that. One last <laughs> question. <laughs> I know Misty wants to get out of here. <laughs> oh, that's me. Um, either to the town attorney or to Andrea. Um, I really want to go back to the, the zone question that I have. We're now setting up and we're defining these areas as zones. Are there any new households or business entities, businesses in this zone? Is it the same border? Well, I know, I can't um, see that. So the, the residential properties are, are staying the same, um, the ones that should be required to have systems are the same ones that were offered systems back in 2003, 2004, 2005. Um, You're not answering my question. Are there any new, in other words, no, I'm, have you not, the not in the, in, not in the resi Go ahead. sorry, not in the residential area with the exception of the two new homes that were built after the fact, after they, they were originally offered. <laughs> with they the, originally in the, in the location of the, uh, they were originally they're in, Yes, they're in that same area. They just are new properties that were, that were built. Right. Um, and that's not what I'm Then as far about. as commercial properties, I believe EPA is going to be reviewing um, a few commercial properties um, to determine whether or not they might need systems installed. Um, Another, uh, so what could add to that is if, say, tomorrow a property that can afford 
you know, in terms of land space, the, you know, subdivide. And so now instead of one property, now you have two properties. So that would add to the existing number in the zone. But is your question, is the zone increasing? That's my question. <laughs> in other words, are we going, are we, is this growing, going to start growing like, is so, this, let me finish. Is this going to start growing like Topsy? In other words, is this going to start to go up, up Ferry Boulevard, start to encompass Elm Street, maybe go down to East Broadway and, and take Warwick and, I mean, are we expanding? So EPA does reserve the right to evaluate whether or not homes on the perimeter of that vapor intrusion zone may be included in the future if groundwater monitoring indicates that the plume has moved outward. So you're you're being you're being productive, and that's always been EPA's EPA stance. They do groundwater monitoring every five years, I think. Um, and so, so far, the zone, the vapor intrusion zone, has not increased. The study area zone, just to be you know clear, has expanded a little bit because not because the contaminants moved beyond, but because EPA changed the value for one of the compounds that is a con contaminant of concern. And so they needed to be uh, more uh, uh, res what? protective or, or restrictive. So they expanded the study area. So the answer to your question is it could in the future. Finish this the question. By putting the maps on the on the ordinance, even if the vapor intrusion area for the EPA expanded, yeah. they'd have to come before the council to expand the ordinance. The ordinance area is set. It's not so if they changed it, the council would have to vote on it. Your your area for our ordinance is just the area defined in those maps. Okay, then under federal regulation, can they find not the individual homeowner or business, can they then find the town for not uh, adopting an ordinance to encompass this new geographic area. I know of no federal regulation that allow them to find the town for failing to expand their regulations. In fact, they've been trying to get the town to adopt this regulation for a number of years, and it just never came up. That's why they were pressing so hard as part of their EPA's remediation of asbestos in town. And the hope, by the way, is when the remediation is done, the groundwater will be less. Their hope is that all the remediation that's theoretically coming to the town is going to decrease this risk, not increase it. Has this ever, has this ever come up before a town council before, or is this the first time? Before yeah. I believe this is, this is, this is the, the first time. So no previous council ever addressed these issues? Not specifically groundwater not or uh, vapor intrusion. I mean, not that they, they haven't, they haven't been, I mean, they've been, you know, briefed on the fact that mm -hmm. OU2 exists, but this ordinance, no. Okay. Thank you. I, I don't know if I can help. Oh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I, I, I don't know if I can help your understanding, but I, re, I was part of a group maybe five years ago that was looking into the asbestos waste problem. I'm sure there are innumerable groups doing this. But at the time, somebody from DEEP did comment on the groundwater part of it, and the vapor comes from the groundwater. Um, and he said that the pollutants that Robestus had put into uh, the earth had gone down to the uh, rock, the, uh, what, what do they call it? B base bedrock, rock, yeah, yeah, bedrock. And According to him, it might take hundreds of years for that to clear off the bedrock. Right, and, I, and I'll tell you something. I've lived here long enough to remember when there were pools as big as half this room in the parking lot where they dumped the chemicals. Just dug a hole in the parking lot and dumped the chemicals in. And it the bubbled ravestus. Well, right, they had lagoons. And then the there thing would come to a certain point, and they'd fill it in and dig another one. Right. And dig another one. Yes. yes. Yeah. They had a series of lagoons. Yeah. Right. So that bedrock situation, I think, is where the source of the contaminated water and hence the vapors are. And I, I think it's pretty much set. So it's pretty, it's, you know, pretty green and clean kind of 
Yeah. I, I look icky actually, to me. We actually have a picture of it flowing in a, a fairy <laughs> sea. I, I just have a question for the lawyer, and that has to do with um, 8B. The property located within the vapor intrusion area, notation is to be included on the assessor's property card, indicating that the property is located within the vapor intrusion zone. My question is, uh, if there is a title search, does that show up? Absolutely. That's the first it thing. It would. Look, okay. The first thing they look at is the field card. So thank you. Very good. Okay. Uh, can I get a motion to recommend this as amended to the town council? With a with favorable recommendation. With a favorable recommendation, yes. Yeah. Second. Second. Second, Ms. Todd. Uh, discussion? All in favor? Uh, aye. 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 Chairman votes aye. Unanimous. Motion to adjourn. Thank you, Andrea. Second. Very Thank good. you, Bruce. All in favor? Thank you very much. Will, will this be on the agenda for the July 10th? Yes. yes. It will be on the next agenda. Yeah. All right.